Good morning, I am Brett Slater. This is The Secret to Money. Uh, today's video is on Napoleon Hill. This man is a legend over generations. Literally has inspired millions of people. I'm gonna say around nine books he's written over his lifetime, Think and Grow Rich. Uh, the success to business, let's have a look at the list here. Think and Grow Rich, The Law of Success, Outwitting the Devil, The Master Key to Riches, How to Raise Your Salary, Napoleon Hill, Key to Successes, Grow Rich, With a Peace, with a peace of Mind, um, I think as well, Law of Attraction. This is a man that has started a revolution. All of the, the greatest coaches, the greatest minds of the 20th century and now into the 21st century. People like Tony Robbins, people like Robert Kiyosaki, of course, Bob Proctor. He is another one, um, which I am going to do a video on him too, Bob Proctor. And they have all read or studied Think and Grow Rich for years and years and years and years and years and years because this man nailed it. He was able to think this through so well that he has like, literally changed, changed the vision of, of millions of people. So there's, there's 10 rules on this video that he is gonna give. Um, I'm not gonna go over them right now, just hang around, the video will go straight into it. I am Brett Slater, this is The Secret to Money. Please hang around and watch Napoleon Hill with his 10 rules to life. I'm going to give you 10 rules for profitable self-discipline. These are rules of my own making. They're very homely, some of them, but they'll be very helpful. And number one is keep cool when other people get hot. I know you can agree with that one, but I'm not so sure that you'll always live up to it. We are inclined, all of us, to get hot when the other fellow gets hot. Say angry things when the other fellow starts saying angry things. I was in the home of the president of a big electric power company one evening when there came a storm and he called up one of his head men to go out to take care of an emergency that happened as a result of that storm. It was on Sunday evening. The man was gone about two hours and when he came back, he came up on the front porch of the home of this man and called him out on the porch and I never heard a man get such a tongue lashing in all my life as this president of the electric power company gets. Says you blankety blank blank, you think because you're the president of the company, blankety blank blank, and I'm just as good as you are, blankety blank blank. Oh, it was terrific. I only heard one side of the conversation because there was only one side of it. One man was doing all the talking, and one man was doing all the listening. And after this had been going on for fully three minutes, the other man ran out of wind and had nothing more to say. He was mad, you see, because they called him out on this stormy night. I heard the president close the door and he came back and he just smiled and said, why, the man was a little bit hot, wasn't he? <laughs> That's all he said. A little bit hot, wasn't he? I expected any moment to hear a fist begin to fly out there. But you see, there was a man who had risen to great uh, heights of achievement financially and he had done it uh, by self-discipline. Self-discipline in every respect. And he didn't propose to allow a workman who had been temporarily unbalanced by his anger to throw him off balance and make him stoop to that level. He just didn't propose to have that done. And you'll notice when you get into an argument with anyone, and you're apt to if you don't watch yourself, that if you just remain silent while the other fellow's blowing off his top, he finally gets to the point where he's got no more top to blow off. Then if you want to get in a few words of your own, that's a mighty good place to do it. It's a mighty fine thing if the words that you get in are not the kind of the words you've been hearing. In other words, if you say something back kind in return, it's far better for the other fellow and far better for you. It shows you to be the bigger of the two persons. Now, anybody can get mad and blow his top because of what somebody does or says, and that's happening all the time. But the truly big man, the man who is in charge of himself, he doesn't allow anybody to draw him down to that level of a street brawl or of an argument in harsh words unless he wants to do it. And if he's truly a big man, he doesn't want to do it. Number two, remember there are three sides to all arguments. We ordinarily think there are two sides to all arguments, but they're not, the three. There's your side, there's the other fellow's side, and then there's the right side, 
which is usually about in the middle of the two viewpoints. Remember that when you get into an argument with the other fellow. Don't assume that he's always at fault. Maybe you're partly at fault too. Maybe neither one is totally at fault. The chances are in all of the arguments I've ever heard, both parties were partly to blame in one way or another. I have never yet heard of an argument where one party entirely was to blame, although I suspect there are such arguments at times. Number three, never give directives to a subordinate when you're angry. If the matter is urgent, then cool off quickly. Number four, treat all people as nearly as possible as if they were rich relatives from whom you expected to be remembered in their will. <laughs> now that's a good one, that's a honey. <laughs> <clears throat> that is a honey, if you just do that. Treat all people as if they were uh, rich relatives from whom you expected to inherit something at their death. And you can do that. You know, if you had a rich relative that had a million dollars he was going to leave to you, or you suspected he was going to, it wouldn't make very much difference what he said or did. He would never throw you off balance. You'd never talk back to him, would you? Of course you wouldn't. You'd be quite silly if you did. <laughs> Keeping quiet for a million dollars seems to me <laughs> to be a very easy price to pay. Number five, look for the seed of an equivalent benefit in every unpleasant circumstance with which you meet, no matter what the unpleasant circumstance is. Make it a point to discipline yourself so that you look for that seed of an equivalent benefit and you start looking in connection with the circumstance. Don't wait a week or two until you've all worked yourself up about it. Start right in where you stand. It'll lessen the blow. It'll lessen the hurt of the wound, whatever it happens to be, if you start looking for that seed of an equivalent benefit. And number six, learn the almost forgotten art of asking questions and then listening to the answers instead of getting the other fellow told off. It gives you an awful lot of satisfaction when you're angry to get the other fellow told, doesn't it? And the temptation is very great to do that. I know, because I've been there many times. Don't do it. Be bigger than that. Listen to what the other fellow has to say. And then when somebody makes a statement that you're not sure about, Learn to ask this one question. It's one of the most important questions in life. It'll serve more purposes than any other short question that I can think of. When somebody makes a statement that you're not sure about or that you doubt or that you question, ask a four-word question. How do you know? And then wait for an answer and see him squirm. Oftentimes there is no answer. People make wild statements that they came back up. And instead of getting into an argument and making an incident out of the matter and getting yourself worked up into an argument, let the other fellow stew in his own fat by putting him over the barrel But that question, how do you know? I had a clergyman in my class once who was very, well, I just don't know exactly how to describe him. He was a, a, a fanatic, you might say, on the subject of religion. And he was sure that he knew exactly what was going to happen to me after death. He said so in no uncertain terms not in the class, but in a private conversation. And he raved and ranted for quite a little while about it. And when he got through, I said, how do you know, Parson? And that really put him over the barrel. He said, that's the way I feel about it. That's my faith. I said, well, now, having a belief in faith is one thing, but having evidence is something else again. How do you know what's going to happen to me after I die? I don't know, and I doubt that you do. How do you know? Well, he never did give me a satisfactory answer. There are a lot of questions that come up in life in connection with which if you'll ask that one thing, how do you know you'll find that the other fellow will be off balance and you don't need to make an incident out of what he says, you don't need to get mad at what he says. Seven, never say or do anything which may influence another person without first asking yourself this question. Will it benefit him or hurt him? And if it will hurt him, don't do it. Don't say anything or do anything that would hurt another person under any circumstances, no matter how much he may deserve. Exercise self-discipline. Don't do that because if you hurt another man, you're going to hurt yourself ten times as much at least because that hurt will come back on you. I don't care who you are nor what circumstances you're working under or living under. If you hurt another person, you will be hurt ten times as much. And if the hurt doesn't come immediately, the... Uh, Rate of interest on that is compound interest on compound interest, and it'll be a hundred times as great if you wait long enough. Because everything that you do to or for another person, you do to or for yourself. There is no escape from that. That's just as much a law as the law of gravitation, which everyone understands. You know that if you stepped off of the top of this building, no matter what your mind uh, was, or what your 
belief happened to be if you stepped over the top of this building and violated the law of gravitation that you'd hit the ground and you'd die in a very few seconds. And this law which brings you back that which you send out is just as inevitable, just as inexorable as the law of gravitation or any other of nature's laws. Number eight, learn the difference between friendly analysis and unfriendly criticism. Then decide which you wish to live by in your relations with others. Now, friendly analysis is one thing and is welcomed by most sensible people. I don't object to friendly analysis of anything that I do, even though it's very unfavorable. If it's friendly analysis, I like it because I can improve by it. But if it's unfriendly criticism, very obviously unfriendly criticism and not analysis, well, then I resent it. I wouldn't be human if I didn't. How can I tell whether it's friendly analysis or unfriendly criticism? <coughs> How would you go about telling a lot of ways you can tell. You can tell by the, uh, your relationship to the person who's making it, whether it's friendly or unfriendly to begin with. If it's an enemy, obviously I discount it right off the bat because you almost know it's going to be unfriendly criticism. I can tell also by the tone of voice in which he does it, by the manner in which he does it. Because a man who engages in unfriendly criticism generally uh, uses a few epithets along with it that clearly indicates that he's biased. If you have self-discipline, you're not going to be influenced by that kind of a person. And number nine, remember that a good leader in any calling is one who can take orders as cheerfully as he gives them. And number ten, last but not least, remember that tolerance in human relations is just as important as tolerance in the operation of mechanics.